My name is Don Patton, and I want to welcome all of you, especially on a night like tonight. The program this evening is going to be in two parts. One is a historical overview of the 34th Division in North Africa and in Italy, or really the mobilization and through. Uh, that's going to be given by Jack Johnson, and then we're going to turn it over and have a panel, and that will be some gentlemen that we'll talk about later. The names you see up here, they've been on the program, and uh, they will tell some of their memories, sad, happy, uh, of their experiences in uh, the 34th Division. Jack, why don't you come forward? It's an honor for me to be here. Uh, in many ways, I think it's uh, apropos that we have weather like this, because the 34th during World War II, we experienced stuff like this quite a bit. We'll talk about that later. We're here to talk about the 34th Red Bull Division. Official nickname, Red Bull, was actually given to it by the German army in Italy, who referred to those soldiers who wore the black and red patches as Red Devils or Red Bulls, and the latter name, uh, name stuck. By those who served in it, however, it was often called the Hard Luck Division. Always in combat, never in the news. It was the first American division to be sent overseas. It fought with distinction in Tunisia and North Africa, and then up the boot of Italy with bravery and dogged determination in some of the uh, toughest conditions that uh, ever confronted an army in what often was referred to as the Forgotten Front. In the end, they amassed more days in combat than any other American division during the war. My role today, as Don said, is to try to provide some kind of an overview uh, and uh, perhaps a bit of context uh, so that you understand how that fit into the bigger picture. That's very tough to do uh, because there's so much material in so little time. So I know I'm going to be leaving out a lot of important topics. I also uh, feel a little bit presumptuous standing up here uh, because I wasn't there. I have a few gray hairs, um, but I'm not in the same league with many of you out there. Uh, my only first-hand experience with World War II is the memory of my dad uh, coming home from the war. I remember his uniform and sitting on his lap and asking him about the ribbons, ribbon bars that were on his service coat. I suppose I was about two and a half years old or so at the time. So. Uh, for those of you who were there, if I say something that doesn't quite ring true with your experience, I hope you'll be forgiving it. 34th Division was created during World War I. It was a National Guard division uh, with troops coming from Minnesota, Iowa, the Dakotas, and Nebraska. They trained at Camp Cody, New Mexico, uh, which was a desert-like area not far from the Mexican border. <coughs> And that provided the basis for the design of their pet, which was a bovine skull superimposed over the shape of a Mexican water jug. After World War I, the division was reorganized with National Guardsmen from Minnesota, Iowa, and the Dakotas. It was called into federal service for one year of what they called precautionary training, federalized on February 10, 1941, and sent to Camp Claiborne, Louisiana. When war finally broke out, December 1941, all enlistments were immediately extended for the duration of the war. The division was hastily moved to Fort Dix, New Jersey, and that was reorganized in January of 1942 from its old square configuration of four infantry regiments to the newer, modern, triangularized configuration of three infantry regiments, the 133rd, 135th, and the 168th, supported by four infantry, or artillery battalions, the 125th, the 151st, the 175th, those three used the, uh, the 105s, and then the 185th that fired the 155 howitzers. The 31st was the first American division to be uh, deployed overseas. Within five weeks of Pearl Harbor, the first elements of the division secretly shipped out for Belfast, Northern Ireland. The first Red Bull off the boat was Private Milborn Hinkey from Hutchinson, Minnesota. He was the first Yank to land in Europe, January 26, 1942. 
This is a picture that appeared in the Belfast newspaper of the 34th, uh, probably on the dock area someplace, uh, as they were getting off the boat. By the end of May, the entire division was training in Northern Ireland and Scotland. And during this time, the elite First Ranger Battalion was formed under the command of one of the division's officers, Captain William Darby, who had been brought in to serve as the general's aide. Uh, the division commander at that time was uh, Russell Hart. And he was told to organize a commando-style uh, battalion. And 80% uh, of that unit's first volunteers came from the 34th Division. It later on became famous as Darby's Rangers. The picture I'm showing you up here is service battery of the 125th Field Artillery that was taken in Northern Ireland when they were there training. <coughs> it was initially hoped that a Western Front could be established by 19 or in 1942 by means of a cross-channel invasion. Uh, of France, but it was soon evident that the Allies were simply not prepared to do that. Uh, the British were pushing hard for American support in the Mediterranean, and so in July 1942 it was decided that a second front should be a southern front with an attack on Axis forces in North Africa. The North African campaign had a number of important objectives. The two most immediately important ones were to divert German resources away from the Soviet front, relieving some of the pressure on the Red Army, which was in crisis there in the summer of 1942, and to draw the German army away from uh, the threat that it was making to the vital oil supplies of the Middle East. Other objectives were to reconstitute the French army as an ally by gaining French-controlled Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria, to open the Mediterranean Sea to Allied shipping, and, of course, to provide a stepping stone for further operations in the Mediterranean. The invasion itself was named Operation Torch. It called for simultaneous landings to be made near the Atlantic port of Casablanca in Morocco and in the Algerian ports of Oran and Algiers. Casablanca here, Oran and Algiers. Small contingents of British troops were then to seize ports in eastern Algeria while a ground column headed for Tunisia in a race to get there before the Germans could move in. The 34th Division commander, which at that time then was Charles Ryder, was in charge of the Eastern Task Force. That was the one that was to land at Algiers. Now, as it turned out, in late October, just as preparations for the invasion were in their final stages, the British 8th Army under Montgomery soundly defeated Rommel's forces in El Alamein. Egypt. Now, Rommel retreated westward. It doesn't show here so much on this particular map, which is looking down on the Mediterranean from, from a, an angle that we're not usually used to looking at. Uh, but the, uh, he retreated westward, westward through Libya and, and towards Tunisia. If Operation Torch and the subsequent sweep into Tunisia was fast enough, then Rommel's German and Italian army could be defeated with converging attacks. That was the idea. Two weeks later, on November 8, 1942, Operation Torch was launched. And here is where the combat history of the 34th Division begins. Elements of the division landed at Algiers. Once again, that was the point right here. In the pre-dawn hours of November 8th, now secret efforts to persuade the Vichy French to not oppose those landings had fallen short of success and there was sporadic fighting on all three landing sites. At Algiers, the most serious resistance was encountered by the 3rd Battalion, 135th Infantry, which was assigned to secure the dock area. <coughs> the French fought back, and the battalion sustained 48 casualties, 15 killed, 33 wounded, before they were surrounded and forced to surrender <coughs> to the French. This was arranged with the French two days later. And on November 11th, Allied forces began to push eastward into Tunisia. It was at this time that the 34th also chopped up another first. The first American artillery fire to be leveled against German forces uh, in World War II came from B Battery 175th Field Artillery at Menjez al Bab, Tunisia, using a British 25 pounder. And that was November 17, 1942. 
By early January, the campaign was bogged down by massive logistical problems and unexpectedly stiff opposition from German reinforcements that had been rushed in by way of Sicily. Elements of the division were also widely scattered at this time. It had taken two months before all of the men of the 34th had been shipped into North Africa. And various division units were scattered everywhere, attached piecemeal to other commands. This is just a quick picture of what Christmas 1942 would have looked like to many of the men of the 34th. slide gives a picture of northeastern Tunisia. Rommel's army had been moving westward here to link up with the uh, German army, uh, Italian German forces, which had been reinforced, and they were under uh, General uh, uh, von Arnhem in the north. And in mid-February 1943, he took a sharp left turn right here and struck hard with armored forces against the U.S. 2nd Corps at Fade Pass. The 2nd Corps was commanded by Lord Lloyd Friedendahl. The 34th had been assigned to the 2nd Corps. And at Fade Pass, Rommel's 21st Panzer Division quickly overran the thinly held positions of the 168th Infantry Regiment. Rommel then continued on through towards Kazarine Pass, where he broke through four days later, intent on taking Teveso, which was a major Allied supply base. His plan was to do a flanking maneuver, push in a northwesterly direction towards the coast, trapping some Allied units and forcing others back into Algeria. The German breakthrough at Bing Pass was costly for the 34th. About half of the 168th Regiment was killed or captured at Bing Pass. Now, as you probably all know, Rommel was not able to sustain uh, his attack, for reasons I don't have time to go into here, but Kazarine certainly was a big wake-up call for the U.S. Army. Several changes were quickly made. From here on out, there would be less intermingling of troops, from different nationalities. Troops would fight under their own commanders, and a division would, to the extent possible, live, train, and fight as a division. Friedendahl was relieved of command and replaced, at least for temporary purposes, by General Patton, given command of the Second Corps. Among other things, Patton required that neckties and steel helmets be worn at all times. Patton also challenged Rommel to a man-to-man -man duel, tank duel, Settle matters, matters that way, we'll put the troops on both sides as spectators. That idea was uh, particularly appealing to men of the 34th who were tired of wearing neckties. <laughs> <laughs> this shows the area around Fade Pass. Get an idea there of, of what the terrain looked like. After Kazarine, the Allies were able to again seize the initiative. By mid-April, the Axis, consisting of five Italian divisions and nine German divisions, had moved into a strongly held defensive perimeter in northeast Tunisia. <coughs> Roughly right here. One side was the sea coast, and the other was about a 140-mile-long range of hills mountains that formed a natural barrier. Our objective was to break through this barrier and take the ports of Bezerk, Tunis, the process forced the surrender of enemy troops. Allied air forces had at this point essentially blocked all enemy transport into or out of Tunisia, so there was no chance for escape and no opportunity for resupply. Command of the Second Corps at this point had been passed on to Omar Bradley, so Patton could prepare for the invasion of Sicily. The Second Corps was given the northern sector, and its assignment was to move on desert. This was the area here. Here's desert. Along a 40-mile front, it was a rugged battle area with a jumbled mass of hills and mountains. Beyond the hills, 
lay the strategic crossroads city of Mature, and then Missouri. There were two natural corridors through these hills and mountains. One was a mouse trap, as Bradley put it, and he refused to be drawn into it. The other was dominated by a peak that was given the name Hill 609. Now, all of these hills, peaks, were named according to their height. So it was 609 meters high, which is about 2,000 feet. And it was the highest point in that part of the region. That hill and the other hills immediately surrounding it had to be swept clear of the enemy. It was the key to mature, desert, and ultimate victory. The critical task of taking it was given to the 34th Division. The surrounding hills all bristled with strong enemy artillery, mortar, and machine gun positions. But one by one, they were taken. After a day of pounding by the artillery, a direct assault on Hill 609 uh, was begun early on April 29th. When the 3rd Battalion, 135th Infantry, moved to the base of the hill and captured a small village. From there, the 34th, with tank support from one company of the 1st Armored Division, began an all-out assault under intense fire. This shows it from the hill, or from the, uh, from the sky. You can see the city of Mature up there. After two days, the hill was finally taken. And with Hill 609 in American hands, the enemy defense line quickly collapsed. Mature fell, and then desert in Tunis, and on May 15, 1943, the enemy surrendered, and the battle for North Africa was over. The campaign had taken six months. 34th casualties in that campaign was 4,049, of which half were missing in action. Next came Italy. Sicily was the stepping stone. Now, the 34th did not take part in the Sicilian campaign, which was relatively short. The Allies pushed enemy forces out of Sicily in July and August, and the success of that uh, prompted the Italian government to drop out of the war. The invasion of Italy began with the British 8th Army under Montgomery, followed a week later on September 9th by the U.S. 5th Army under Mark Clark at Salerno, about 25 miles south of Naples. You can see that here. It was hoped that our attack on Italy would persuade Germany to cut their losses in Italy and quickly retire, retire to a defensive line somewhere in the north, perhaps along the foothills of the Alps. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out that way. The 34th was designated as a reserve force for the invasion, but its 151st Field Artillery <coughs> Battalion was temporarily detached to help the 36th Division establish a beachhead at Salerno. The Germans had launched a bewildering night counterattack on the beachhead just as the 151st was landed. The artillery men turned it back. The Chief of Staff for the 36th later commented, quote, the beachhead would have been destroyed had it not been for the early arrival of the 151st. They shot it out with the Germans for eight days, fired more ammunition in those days than they had in the entire Tunisian campaign Salerno. The rest of the 34th arrived at Salerno a few weeks later, after the beachhead had been secured. It's a picture of the men from the division loading up into an LCI. The initial Allied objective was to force the enemy out of southern Italy and to capture the Winter Line, a formidable chain of German defensive positions which spanned the entire peninsula above Naples. On the east, the British 8th Army moved more or less parallel to the American 5th Army, which was on the west. So the 8th Army came up this way, moving here, the 5th Army. This shows the position of that winter line. The winter line actually consisted of three different lines, each a progressively tougher barrier than the one before it. First was the Barber line, which is down in here, and then the Bernard line, which sometimes referred to as the Reinhardt line, 
following us <coughs> here. And finally, the Gustav Line, which was a system of sophisticated interlocking defenses that the Germans were determined not to yield. And it was anchored by a superb natural fortress called Monte Cassino. Here's the Gustav Line, all the way down Monte Cassino here. These defenses were made possible by the fact that there were so few well-defined corridors through which a motorized army could pass. There were only two roads between Naples and Rome. Both of them had been laid out on routes that the uh, Roman Empire had built 2,000 years earlier. One was Highway 7, referred to in ancient times as the Appian Way, which went here, followed along the coast. And the other was Highway 6, that threaded its way through the mountains. Now, the virtue of Highway 6 to the Allies was that once it passed Casino, it led into the Leary River Valley, here, which was thought of as the gateway to Rome, much easier way to enter in. And that's the route that was decided upon. If the Allies could break into the valley, they could move on Rome with greater ease. But to get there, they would first have to overcome the Barber Line, pass through a narrow mountain corridor called the Luciano Gap, and then break through the main winter line uh, fortifications at Casino, and along the Rapida River, which was a natural barrier that ran across the entrance to the valley. Fighting from Salerno <coughs> to the winter line was as hard and unforgiving as ever to face an army. Not only was it the worst combat terrain in Europe, the campaign took place in constant mud, snow, rain, wind. Uh, the rains came early that year in 1943 and with unusual force. And then there was the Volturno River, a formidable barrier that was heavily defended. It had to be crossed three times by the division because of the way it always bent back and forth on itself. The pattern of fighting for the 34th became all too familiar. You would fight bitterly for a hill, you would take it eventually, and then you would move on to the next hill. The Germans mined and wired and fired upon every passage. The entire route was perfect for defensive operations. But gradually, one by one, the strategic objectives were taken. Monte Pantano, San Vittori, Monte Lacchiaia, Monte Trocchio, the Rapido River. Hand to hand combat was often needed in order to root the enemy out of his holes in the mountains or the rubble of buildings. Picture of the, some men from the 135th. That's a dead German sniper in, on the cart there in the middle, uh, taken at San Vittori in uh, early January 1944. Men frequently fought in regions which could only be supplied by animal pack trains. Monte Pantano exemplified how difficult it was to fight in the rocky hills and mountains. Pantano, 3,000 feet high, was fissured by gullies, peppered with enemy dugouts, concealed mortar and artillery positions, minefields. Enemy weapons were often placed on reverse slopes in ravines to bring fire on any approaching force. The Red Bull attack on Monte Pantano was led off by the 168th Infantry on November 29th, and by the time it was relieved by the 135th Infantry, after six days of fighting, the 168th had lost all of its battalion commanders, together with 33 other officers, 386 men killed or wounded. It had expended 6,800 rounds of 81 millimeter mortar ammunition, 3,000 hand grenades, 7,500 artillery rounds, and 400,000 rounds of rifle and machine gun ammunition. And only one knob of Monte Pantano was in our possession. Now, this picture here is actually not Monte Pantano. I didn't have one. This picture shows the mountain area near Casino. And I think that's a German uh, soldier that's looking out at it. But it gives you a, a, some idea of what the terrain was like. Within six weeks of the Salerno landings, our troops were tired, wet, cold, morale was flagging, Enemy resistance was consistently tougher than expected, and there was no immediate hope for improvement. 
To restore maneuver to the battlefield, Allied leaders decided upon an end run to carry out an amphibious landing behind enemy lines at Anzio, 35 miles southeast of Rome. <coughs> Here's Cassino here. The plan called for the 5th Army to land its 6th Corps, consisting of 400,000 troops, at Anzio and rapidly drive inland toward Rome. The strategy that was designed to also cut enemy supply and communication lines north of the Gustav Line. It could also force the enemy to turn some of its resources away from the Gustav Line in order to contain the thrust at Anzio. But like so many things in the Italian campaign, it didn't go as planned. The 6th Corps landed at Anzio on January 22nd unopposed, but the Corps commander decided to dig in at the beachhead before launching his attack inland. And that was all it took for the German army to move 70,000 troops uh, quickly into the Anzio area. And the situation quickly became a nightmare. The beachhead and ships near the shore were under incessant attack and shelling from uh, artillery and dive bombers. We managed to uh, beat off a series of powerful German counterattacks, but their excellent defensive positions in the foothills surrounding Anzio effectively halted our breakup. In the meantime, German defense of the Gustav Line was as determined as ever. Anzio had not drawn enemy resources away from his defense of the line as we expected. <coughs> Ironically, it now became imperative for the rest of the 5th Army to break through the Gustav Line defenses so that it could draw the enemy away from the beleaguered Anzio beachhead. The rest of the 5th Army, which at this point was the British 10th Corps, a French Expeditionary Force, and the 2nd Corps, which included the 34th Division, was to attack toward the Rapido and Garigliano rivers down in this area here. <coughs> They would then cross the rivers, take the high ground on both sides of the Leary Valley, and advance north to link up with the Anzio beachhead. The plan quickly bogged down, however. The British encountered heavy resistance at the Garigliano River and were not able to move forward. This left uh, the flank of the U.S. Second Corps unprotected as it prepared to storm the Rapido River the next day with the 36th Division. The red ones here are the uh, site of attack for the 36th Division on the river. The attempting crossing, the attempted crossing of the river, and this shows the repeat of would have been difficult in any case, but under withering enemy fire it turned out to be a disaster. The 36th Division suffered severe casualties trying to cross it, with one entire regiment virtually wiped out. They were unable to break through into the valley. And so General Clark decided to try and outflank it by launching attacks over high ground northeast of Casino. The job went to the 34th Division with aid from French troops and the one remaining regiment of the 36th Division. The division attacked the network of hills near Casino. Maybe to give you some. Idea. Here's the town of Casino. Here's the abbey, which was up at the high point. And there were a network of hills in here. The division attacked the network of hills near Casino and attempted to storm the abbey itself and stood on the summit. Over several days of fighting, the 34th was able to establish a foothill on the ridges behind the monastery and to entrench itself in the city of Casino itself. But the Germans defied all attempts to wrest control of the city or other nearby positions. Stiff resistance was encountered at every turn. The fighting was close and intense, with every house and rock pile in contention. The 35th, 135th Regiment was this area up here, the 168th down here through the middle, and the 133rd was down in here into the town. In the town itself, artillery barrages had created piles of rubble that gave protection and hiding places for German troops who refused to withdraw or surrender. 
In a classic description of the fighting, Red Bull veterans still recall an official communique by one of their lieutenants who said, uh, talking about the activity of the day, quote, today we captured two living rooms and a bedroom. <laughs> Finally, after four weeks of constant fire, we treated repeated attacks and counterattacks, and seemingly endless days and nights on the barren hills exposed to cold rain, wind and snow, the depleted ranks of the 34th were exhausted. The battle came to an end for the 135th and 168th regiments on the night of February 14 and 15, when they were relieved by the 4th Indian Division. The 133rd Regiment was not able to be relieved until uh, February 22nd, after the bombing of the Abbey. When the 34th was finally pulled out, many of our men had stuck it out for so long and suffered so much that they had to be lifted bodily from their foxholes and carried down the steep descents to the positions in the rear. Some historians contend that the assault on Casino was ill advised, that the eventual gains did not justify costs or the destruction of the Abbey, which was bombed into oblivion the day after the 135th and the 168th left the line. But that doesn't diminish Casino as the battle of battles for the 34th <clears throat> Division. It symbolized the level of sacrifice, determination, and courage, which is second to none in the war. Eventually, it took five divisions. The total destruction of the abbey, the town, and the surrounding countryside, and three and a half months of continuous battle to drive the Germans out of Casino. This shows uh, what the destruction looked like, how well you could see it uh, at the end here. There's the, the remains of the monastery up there. This was something called Castle Hill, uh, and what's left of the town down here. <coughs> After Casino, the division was sent uh, for a short rest and fresh replacement troops were brought in to replace the depleted ranks. And then in mid-March, it was sent to Anzio, where Allied forces were still stalled on the beachhead. The division's breakout finally came on May 23rd, followed by the drive on Rome. Men of the 135th Regiment, who uh, were among the first to enter the city, they were attached with the 1st Armored Division. And they went in on June 4th, 1944. They mopped up snipers around the Colosseum that evening. The 133rd Regiment, in the meantime, was taking the vital port of Citadel Vecchia, northwest of Rome. Elsewhere, off the coast of Normandy, the Allies were about to invade France, and Germany was now defending itself on all three fronts. After Rome, the division continued on up the boot of Italy through heavily entrenched German positions. Resistance was stubborn but declining in strength as the 34th routed Germans out of Belvedere, San Vincenzo, Cicino, Lake Park, Pisa, and others. It's a picture of uh, some men from the 135th going through the Bormo, summer of July 1944. This is a picture uh, in the Leghorn area, taken July 22nd, 1944, 135th infantry moving up to the line as, uh, as civilians are evacuated to the rear. Then came the Arno River, the Gothic line along the Apennines, finally a bold campaign for the Po River Valley, which contained 80% of Italy's war industries. The division was ordered to hold and wait during the winter of 1944-45, just south of Bologna. This shows a little bit of the elegant living conditions they had that winter. Um, it says Company B, 135th Infantry in January 1945. Uh, these are some men from 135th uh, watching the rising Adisi River, wondering whether they need to pull up stakes or not. I don't know if they ultimately did in February 1945. The final events of came in mid-April. German defense wall caved in quickly, and Bologna was taken. It's a picture of the victory celebration in Bologna. The 34th was the first uh, division allowed to enter the city. <coughs> After Bologna, the once powerful German army began to quickly disintegrate. 
and their retreat soon became a rout. On May 2, 1945, the remnants of the 75th German Corps surrendered 40,000 men to the Red Bulls near Milan. And ironically, the surrendered troops included the German 34th Infantry Division. The war in Europe came to an end a few days later with some Red Bulls positioned on the borders of France and Switzerland. <coughs> This is a cartoon that appeared in the Stars and Stripes magazine by Bill Malden uh, towards the end of the war there. I don't know if it shows, but uh, down on the bottom, it says, uh, the doc says it's nothing serious, just hardened arteries. <laughs> it uh, was a recognition of the length of time that the division had been in combat. After some rest, sightseeing and occupation duty, the 34th sailed home in October. Its men were mustered out on November 3rd, 1945, at Camp Patrick Henry, Virginia. Of the several thousand Midwestern Guardsmen who left for Camp Cleveland on a cold February day in 1941, and who had been among the first American troops to land in Europe, only a handful remained with the division at the end. Casualties, uh, illness, transfers, and rotations out accounted for the rest. The division had completed a record that included 517 days of frontline combat and five major campaigns, more combat days than any other American division in any theater of the war. With some elements, the division credited with over 600 days of combat. Casualties included 3,737 killed, 14,165 wounded, 3,460 missing in action. They had given out 1,072 silver stars, 98 distinguished service crosses, 11 medals of honor. In addition to the personal awards and decorations, the division garnered three presidential unit citations, 15 unit commendations, and 525 separate division citations. The 100th Nisi Infantry Battalion, which was composed of U.S. citizens of Japanese descent, had been attached to the 34th for most of the Italian campaign, became the most highly decorated battalion in the U.S. Army. This is a picture of General Bolte. He was the division commander at the end of the war, pinning a legion of merit on uh, Staff Sergeant John Colhane of Minneapolis, Company D of the one, uh, two of the 135. The men of the 34th, uh, the hard-fought victory was bittersweet. Not only had they paid a very high price, but it was their unfortunate lot that once the Allies uh, hit the beaches at Normandy, Italy really had become something of a forgotten front. The merits of the Italian campaign can always be, be debated, but I don't think anyone can fail to appreciate the dog faces of the 34th. It may have been a hard luck division, but their tenacity, bravery, and skill in the face of great hardships and dangers or something that all of us can be deeply proud of. Thanks very much. As we do with each of our programs, we try to relive this with some of the personal memories of the people that fought there. Our first uh, speaker and I will introduce them and then we will give them the floor. Uh, Major General Don Grant, who started as a uh, first lieutenant in the 151st Artillery and ended up as the battalion commander of the 185th Artillery. Ray Schultz was the second on your right. Uh, Ray was in Company F, 134th Infantry of Wauseka and uh, became such a veteran that they uh, recycled him into Company A of the 135th, but the 135th wouldn't let him go. Archie Shrewsbury was a uh, private, later buck sergeant in the 151st, and of course many of you may have known him over at the University of Minnesota ROTC uh, department. Norb McCready was in Company F of the 134th and was a scout in the 2nd Battalion. And General Jack Vesey, uh, who must have had every rank in the military, was a first sergeant in the division artillery for the 134th. 
So those are our group of speakers. One of the things I, I uh, would like to uh, say, and I think it really talks about the leadership that must have been in the 34th. When we first started assembling the program, we ended up with a lot of artillery guys. And General Grant said, I'm not going to be on the program if you don't, don't have some dog faces. I uh, had some real key points, and they were well covered. So I'm just going to trace from induction until we came home. We were called in on February 10th, and stayed in the Army for about two weeks. I was put in a rather relatively junior first lieutenant put in command of a battalion of artillery trucks to take them down to Claiborne. And it was an interesting ride. We didn't have any problems, but we were lost most of the time. <laughs> when we uh, got to Kansas City, we would park our trucks in the basement of their convention center. Well, the police met us at the boundary of the town and said, follow me, and they took off at 50 miles an hour. Well, we were still looking for trucks at midnight. <laughs> it was 5 o'clock. We had trucks rolling all over. We did get them all back <laughs> and proceeded to the rest of the trip without any difficulty. But uh, when we got to Craigborn, I don't know. Remember, but it was mud. We talked about mud in Italy and so forth. But there was mud, and we drove a truck into the battery street, and it just gently settled down. <laughs> so we were riding on the truck body, had the A front and back out. But uh, the, the artillery had to have service practice, and when we went out in the field, in order to get the guns and trucks into position, we had to build a corduroy road, which was uh, something new because we weren't engineers. But uh, it was the first few months were sent, spent sending people to school. I'm sure that happened in the infantry. I, I can only look through my novel, which is an artillery novel. Mm -hmm. But we sent people as fast as we could to the, the service schools. And uh, we were able to start reorganizing, and all of a sudden somebody started a war. So um, less than a month later, we were on our way to Dix to be staged for overseas. We didn't know it. We just started moving mm -hmm. the Dix. And it was probably the coldest winter they ever had in Fort Dix. We burned down a tent a day with the wooden stoves. And uh, didn't know where we were going. We finally realized we were going someplace. But, uh, uh, and we didn't know we were trying to our division. We went over the first battalion of the 151st. And the second battalion never came. It became the second battalion of the 175th, first attack on 175th. And we, uh, I was fortunate. I didn't spend all my time in the tent. I got married at Fort Dix three days before I went overseas. So I did have two nights in the officer's club <laughs> out of the cold. <laughs> and uh, we arrived in Ireland after we, when we left. You wouldn't believe the convoy we had. We had two ships, and a battleship, a cruiser, and I don't know how many, uh, what's the little destroyers? Destroyers. They were, they were had us bundled up. And when we got opposite of Iceland, the other ship took off. And we got up in the morning and there wasn't a ship in the whole sea except ours. <laughs> Looked out the window and, and finally somebody, Gene Surdick and I were looking, what's that over there? It looked like a piece of rubbish in the, in the water. And it was a Corvette, which the British equivalent of the destroyers. 
and they uh, uh, British took over. That was their protection. Two Corvettes. Yeah. But we made it and landed in Ireland and uh, they gave us a sandwich and put us on a train and we went to Bellamina. We moved on uh, on Lock Foyle, where, near Liverpool. And the uh, Irish people thought we were the silent army. We had rubber, rubber heels. And I don't know if you remember the British boots, but when they stand for the South Coast. And, uh, but we were a whole battalion of us walking along, and they didn't even hear us. They had their lights out and were watching us pretty carefully. We were uh, then issued the 25 pounder. The 25 pounder was developed because it had 360 degree travers. We didn't, and the British developed it after their fiasco and trying to get being surrounded by tanks. And we couldn't, it only take them in a fan about like that. So uh, we were issued 25 pounders and trained with them for a uh, whole time we were there. We went up in the Sparrow Mountains and had service practice and we went to Hawks Park Point and uh, had, had a tank practice. And we, uh, we kind of liked the gun after a while. It, it was, uh, looked like it was put together with a little haywire and tape. But it did a job. It was relatively short uh, range. It fired up to about 13,000 feet yards, rather. And, uh, but when you got up around 13,000 yards, the whole thing would almost come apart. You left all the ammunition, the bags of ammunition, and it was, but it was it was a serviceable weapon, and we went overseas without any. Didn't even have sidearm. The officers had their 45s, but the artillery, as you may know, was equipped with 45s, but they didn't have them. British Enfields, British Enfields, must have been part of the agreement. I don't know what it was, but. Uh, we, we spent eight, nine months getting ready. And about in the middle, uh, you heard him mention Bill Darby, he was a colonel, not a captain. And he was the one that organized the Rangers. And uh, we had, uh, I don't know how many uh, volunteers, but we had a number of volunteers. Matter of fact, I put my hand up, and the criminal said, "Put your hand up." <laughs> so I, mean, I, I thank my lucky stars for that. <laughs> uh, one of the chores we had uh, was censoring mail. You didn't like to have the mail censored. We didn't like to do it. We had to do it anyway. And while we were at Dick's, I had a soldier named uh, Samson P. Winston, <laughs> and he sent a post. I can remember it as if it were yesterday. It said it was addressed to William Morbon. Red Scaffold, South Dakota. And then in the legend, it started out how. At the bottom, it signed Sam. And then a gibberish. Just nothing. So I called Sam and said, I can't read this, Sam. What does it say? He says, Never mind. Tore it up and made pieces and laid it on the counter. <laughs> what he had done, he'd spend about three and a half hours with his English to Sioux dictionary. And it was phonetic only. They never, never had a written language. <laughs> and uh, apparently it said something, but uh, he didn't get any place with it. <laughs> he didn't go to for, uh, William Morbon. The uh, well, in December they started staging us to go. To, we went to Liverpool and uh, staged to go to Africa on Her Majesty's ship, His Majesty's ship, the Empress of Australia, which was a ship that the 
Kaiser had built to take him around the world after he conquered. But, and they never took anybody any place after we went we went to Africa in it because we were grand. Took pieces to drive a jeep through twenty feet above the city. Waterline and 20 feet below. The convoy commander, whoever it was, had uh, been misunderstood. So this guy was over on our side. We turned this way and he turned that way. The last I heard, it was still there in 1945 in Iran. Huh. We, were, we were at least not terrorized, but we were uncomfortable. They looked for a place to beach it so it wouldn't sink up in the Mediterranean. And it was all mine, so they just went through about like that. We uh, went into combat. Now, I'm, my dates are not the same as the ones some of you heard. But we were, we were first met, saw our first crowd on February 16th, which was my birthday, my 30th birthday. We fired at them all day and retreated all night. We fired all day for three days. And General Ryder said, this is where we stopped. That was Sabino. And we were there for 30 days, I think, about that, without a bath. You know, outside the helmet bath. And uh, on British rations. Has anybody ever had British rations? <laughs> There's somebody back there. Well, British rations consisted mainly of mutton and uh, Brussels sprouts. <laughs> I, I can't uh, look a sheep in the face. <laughs> when we stopped there, we stayed there for 30 days. The writer said this is where we stopped, and we did stop. After 30 days, we went on to the took Fondue Pass. The infantry took it. We helped with throwing shells over their head. And we were taken out and staged for 609. That was a miserable hill. Just climbing it was, it was almost impossible. And fighting it. I had nothing but admiration for the infantry. The artillery had nothing to do. We couldn't capture anything. We couldn't do a thing. We had to try to support infantry. Now, I, uh, while we, right after we took 609, we were issued uh, 105 houses and given 24 hours to familiarize ourselves with them and go back into combat. And uh, within two, three days, we went through Chiriguri Pass. And the war was over, as far as in, in Italy. But uh, I had an interesting job for, I was Provost Marshal of Tunis for a short time. I wouldn't want to do it again. <laughs> my biggest trouble was soldiers throwing hand grenades in the Bay of Tunis getting fish. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had to appear before the day or the day, I don't know. I get confused with B, Y, and D, Y. Both of them are officials in the government. But he made it known in certain terms that that had stopped. <laughs> oh, after while we went back to Iran, staged for landing at Salerno. Well, the 151st, as was mentioned, saved the beachhead. And when we arrived, uh, we landed at Salerno. And I got my most serious wound. I was eating cornflakes and sugar and milk. And he, he rode in on it. <laughs> <laughs> he kicked me three times before I 
it's a good amount. <laughs> One of the, incidentally, Sam once went into the Rangers. He was a big, husky, strong man. And they put him right, driving a jeep instead of taking a combat sword. But then we, uh, I went through Italy most of the, we crossed the Volturno three times. Actually, I crossed it four. There was, after the third crossing, we went up and we leave the French and we had to cross the river there, but then it was all, it was peaceful. We had to fight our way through the others. And uh, speaking of the 168th Infantry results on Mount Pantano, they lost four battalion commanders in two hours. So there were captains commanding battalions. Battalion, battalion, and look when it fell. <coughs> And we were in Anzio, as we indicated, and st stood there. Just I don't know. I, we were in a basement of a combine, a commune, a tiny commune, and uh, we had we averaged about 300 rounds a day landing right in. The, uh, we were in the basement, pretty safe, and we in order to go. To Follow the wall, and uh, we only had one one casualty in that in two and a half months. And then we were, I was talked about the uh, ink. My my kids were athletes, and they, when they got the name of the paper, they got ink. But with the ink from thirty fourth got was in fact we not existent when we went through Rome, because D Day was cooking. We, we went on towards Chilevecchia. Chilevecchia was the first good sized town on the coast on the way up to Leghorn, the Horn, I guess it's about. And we saw what was shooting at us. They had a 170 gun, which would fire 30,000 yards, 40,000. It was railroad mounted. And uh, it was awesome. Just just to see the damn thing. It was in the rear yards, it was ours then. But I was in then in the 185th. And the 185th had Schneiders. Uh, Schneiders, a 155 house from World War One. And the they were smooth boards. We were afraid to ram them put the shell in and seat it. If you hit it too hard, we're afraid it'd spit out the end because we warned the end. We warned the ends out. And uh, then we were in position once we were back in the line. Well we had lots of ammunition for Schneiders and we had M1s. Mm -hmm. There was no firing table for it. So we had to produce our own firing table. We put two observers fire where it hit the water was the new firing information we needed to fire the gun. Well I read I was saved the problem of it. I designed it and then I went home for thirty days of recuperation and rehabilitation. <laughs> Good time. And I, when I got back to the north of the Florence and Stayed that winter in the spring. We burst into Florence, but I, I, I disagree with my previous. The uh, we were held outside of Bologna, and some other up there. I think the British were first in, and uh, so we went up the uh, Old River Valley rather rapidly, and. You can't imagine some of the poor equipment that those guys, those Germans did with such skill. They even had horse and arm, the horse drawn artillery. And I hadn't been, I had joined the horse artillery in, in 1928, and we didn't have any horses after 31. But 
it was an interesting ride, and I'm, I'm like an old soldier friend of mine says, World War One, and World War Two would pass by my house and I was sitting on the porch. I wouldn't turn my head to look at it, but I wouldn't take a million dollars from my experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. And if I could, uh, Don Frederick is one of those uh, 135th guys that was in the first Rangers. Are there any other Rangers that came out of the 134th in the audience? Well, Don, would you raise your hand? 135th. In the oh, 135th, I'm sorry. Yeah. Don has been our speaker. Uh, I'm not correct. I was in Battery F 151 artillery when I left the uh, Rangers. <laughs> It's a pretty tough act. <laughs> pretty tough act to follow here. Sounds like all he had was fun all the way through. The <laughs> <laughs> but I'll try to give you a little picture of uh, one man's travel through the uh, through the system of going to war. And for my uh, start, it all began in 1941. <laughs> Company F line 35th and Virginia, Minnesota National Guard located at the time, uh, was in the process of soliciting recruits for one year enlistments. And I, like a lot of 18 year olds with a prospect of a job, without a prospect of a job, saw this as an opportunity to see this, some of the world. There were 13 of us from Wasika who signed on and were sworn in on February the 10th. We spent 15 days preparing to leave for Camp Claiborne, Louisiana on February 25th. Our training began almost as soon as we arrived. I had the good fortune of being able to use a typewriter, so I became the assistant company clerk and avoided most of the company training. I wanted to tell you where I was. Well, yeah, I was the company clerk instead of an infantryman out there. So, uh, uh, in early August, we took part in the Louisiana maneuvers, which lasted until the end of September. And about that time, we began to think about the short time we had left in our enlistments. <laughs> then came Pearl Harbor, and as the old World War I saying goes, it was the first of September, and that was the last of August. <laughs> this was taken from a letter to the family of a soldier named August who was killed in World War I. And that was the end of our one year enlistment. It lasted three and a half years. <laughs> Our first move after Pearl Harbor was to the Naval Air Base in New Orleans for guard duty. We returned to Claiborne fairly soon, and on January 8, 1942, we shipped out to Fort Dix, New Jersey, to prepare for embarkation. On April 30th, 1942, we boarded the passenger liner Aquitania and arrived in Northern Ireland on May the 11th, 1942, the first Army Division to land overseas. Some of this is going to be sort of overspent on Jack, also the general here. But anyway, I'm going to go through it just as I put it down. Shortly after arrival in Ireland, <clears throat> I was elevated or Shanghai. Take your pick. From my position as assistant company clerk to assistant squad leader in the third platoon. Gotcha. PFC to corporal. I thought I had the world by the tail about that time. Most uh, all of our time in Ireland was pretty intense combat training. F Company was housed for a time in the second floor of the courthouse in Oma. A couple of years ago, Connie and I were fortunate enough to locate two residents of Oma who remember the day that F Company arrived in their town. The regiment's first mission fell on the soul's shoulders of our 3rd Battalion. This was covered by Jack. They were placed on detached service in October 42, training for combat landing in Algiers. The landing took place on November 8th and ended almost the same day with major casualties, 15 killed and 33 wounded. Our first and second battalion went to uh, Liverpool, England and embarked for North Africa. Christmas, this is telling something about the general here. Our Christmas dinner was uh, highlighted by a main course of a pork chop one-third of an inch thick floating in a tin pan of greasy water. <laughs> that was a Navy, uh, Navy mess hall. We arrived in Algeria near Oran on the 1st of January 1943. 
And by January the 11th, the regiment was all together in the vicinity of Clemson. We resumed training, moved on to Maktar, Tunisia. And the rest of February was relatively uneventful until February the 26th, 19, uh, 26th and 27th. Our third platoon was assigned to support a reconnaissance mission at a place called Kef El Amar. This turned out to be a major incident, our first taste of the real thing. With 16 Purple Hearts, four killed in action, and two captured. Four of us missed the truck sent to pick us up. We wandered for two days in the desert before finding our company. The next incident occurred at Fondue on March 27th through 30th. With 51 Purple Hearts, two killed in action, no advance. The second Fondue on April 8th, we tried it again. This time we succeeded on April 8th and got through on April 8th and got out of there with 31 Purple Hearts and four killed in action. This is pretty much a single company's picture here rather than a battalion or anything like that. So it's, it's kind of interesting how this all, all plays out. The next incident was Hill 609 with both those gentlemen talked about. Our company had 32 Purple Hearts and two killed in action in that, in that situation. And this was the end of the African campaign. Uh, just prior to leaving Africa for the trip to Italy, I happened to be in the first sergeant's tent. There was a memo on his desk transferring six of F Company's finest, or heroes, three to the 1st Battalion and three to the 3rd. My name was first on the list and I landed in A Company. We left for Italy on September 15th, landed at the Gulf of Salerno. While in A Company of the 1st Battalion, we were engaged in battles at Salerno. Eight Purple Hearts, one killed. Mont Calavito, three Purple Hearts. Mont Trocchio, 17 Purple Hearts, and three in action. San Angelo, 20 Purple Hearts, one killed in action. Monte Cassino, 21 Purple Hearts, three killed in action. Manzio, 63 Purple Hearts, and two killed in action. And Rosignano, 33 Purple Hearts, and three killed in action. These are a sample of the, the battalion's activity for our, our particular company, so that gives you some kind of an idea of what was going on. <coughs> I was wounded at Monte Cassino. In February, Earth returned to duty with A Company at Anzio. On May the 23rd, the breakout from Anzio began and was completed on 26th of May. On May 27th, the 100th Battalion joined this regiment. This is a battalion of Nisis from Hawaii. On May the 31st, the regiment continued to attack and on June 5th entered Rome. The regiment continued north, although the pace was slow because of the mountainous terrain and the periodic clashes with the enemy. I returned to the States in October on points furloughed January 1st, 1945, and was assigned to a German POW camp for Africa Corps veterans. And I was assigned as an NCO for one of the POW companies. In the compound, I was charged with the daily reports on their assignments and other activities, most of which took place in the Cleveland area and war plants. This group was made up of some of Hitler's finest and was subject to strict discipline. The first sergeant of my unit was a long-time veteran and a very interesting soldier. Remember uh, remember the 13 enlistees from Wasika I started out with? Five were killed in action, nine Purple Hearts, and two Oak Leaf Clusters. And I close this out with the two companies that took up most of my time. Company F, Purple Hearts, 560. Killed in action, 112. Company A, Purple Hearts, 44, 400, 4, 447, and KIA is 80. Uh, and this is all, this is one company. We're turning out with the 5,000 Purple Hearts, 2,000 killed in action. So a, this is kind of a picture of what happened to one, one company. Thank you. I like to reminisce with you folks a little bit about what it feels like to come out of civilian life 
and into the military when you're so damn dumb that you don't know that you are not supposed to salute a corporal. <laughs> First of all, I, I wasn't uh, Cairo, I wasn't innocent. I uh, was a member of the Depression generation, so uh, I knew what hard times were. I bummed around a little. I, I uh, toured the South Side Door Pullman. Uh, I worked as a carny. I'd committed marriage and divorce. <laughs> and I'd worked in uh, the harvest, uh, work, uh, harvesting Elsac clover up in Kuchichin County, way up on the Canadian border. And uh, so, uh, uh, getting into the Army, I should have been able to uh, not be surprised. However, uh, <laughs> With all of that background, I was still totally unprepared for what I was going to encounter when I joined the Guard. Ed Horning and I joined the Guard t uh, together, talked into it by Joe Polivchak, a kid in our neighborhood, who was a sergeant in E-Battery. And uh, <coughs> Ed was able to get in right away. Uh, this was in the in the fall of 1940 when uh, they'd been alerted that they were going to be federalized. One of the older guys dropped out and Ed got in. But I had to wait about six weeks before uh, there was an opening where I could get in. When I finally made it, I said to Joe, and we were riding home on the Grand Monroe streetcar, well, Joe, I finally made it. Now I can go south with you guys. He said, cut out that Joe shit, Shrewsbury. My name is Sergeant Polivchak, and don't you forget it. <laughs> so the time for my enlistment in the Guard until we were activated was mainly spent in learning the, the rank structure and the names of the, of the men in the battery. I learned some of the terminology, fall in, fall out, and ease. <laughs> All attempted by some guy that was uh, trying to sound basso profundo when he was talking. <laughs> our, our uniforms were an amalgam of uh, horse artillery clothing that uh, used boots with leather face puttees over the over britches, so that they uh, puffed way out on the side. They looked kind of ridiculous, but uh, that's what we had when we were first enlisted. Our shirts were a little bit more acceptably styled, but uh, and the campaign hats in E Battery that I joined, you had to have a Stetson uh, campaign hat. You had to buy it yourself. So, but just uh, just before we were federalized, uh, clothing came through so that we did get uh, the, a normal OD uniform, uh, trousers and shoes. So. Uh, that allowed us to wear canvas laced up leggings, as most of you guys are familiar with. And we also uh, we learned a few raucous and lewd songs that were a source of embarrassment to the moms and the wives and sweethearts who came down to the army to watch us as, as we were grilling. Uh, I'll give you one of them. Our captain's a lantern jawed bastard. Our first lieutenant drink gin. Our second lieutenant's a fairy. My God, what an outfit we're in. Gin, gin, sin. My God, what an outfit we're in. I've been singled out as a truck driver, so at the end of February, Dick Sandy and I got into this, uh, it was a 1933 Chevy, and we fell in, in the convoy that was led by uh, <laughs> 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 Grant. <laughs> it, was a, it was about a 1,200-mile trip, and uh, that was the longest as far as I've been able to uh, determine uh, the longest military convoy that had ever been taken, undertaken in the United States at that time. 
Oh. And we bedded down in armories and auditorium, and uh, they messed us uh, at night and at breakfast in these various places uh, that we would encamp. And then they would make up sandwiches for us to take for the noon meal. And it was the old army stable. Staple. Ham, jam, and cheese. <laughs> and an apple. And the, the liquid or the, the, the drink was water. Unless you were able to break down on some roadside stand or a bar or someplace, <laughs> run in and make a purchase. Uh, I know going through Arkansas, we were able to buy a real good wine that they sold in some of these, these uh, roadside stands. And as far as I can see right now, the only thing that I've ever encountered in Arkansas that was a product that was worth even taking a second look at was that wine. <laughs> <laughs> the arrival of the convoy at uh, Claiborne was less than as auspicious. True, the band was there to greet us as the trucks rolled into camp. However, they were up to their knees in the shittiest looking mud we'd ever seen. <laughs> the winter months were as celebrated in Louisiana with rain as Minnesota is with snow. So you get the picture. The armed forces in early 1941 were ill prepared for the impending global conflict, but the servicemen were more amenable to training than any that uh, had been encountered since then. And I'll tell you why. First, we did emerge from the longest depression that the nation had ever suffered. So these the men knew what hardships were. Additionally, there were a high percentage of farm-raised men who came to us initially uh, in, in uh, 34th Division from the Dakotas, Montana, some of them was Wisconsin, and the rest of them from Minnesota. They were tough, they knew how to work. <clears throat> and additionally to that, we had an officer corps whose members had been schooled in World War I, many of them, and they had been victorious in fighting the Kaiser and his army. So we had good leadership. <clears throat> now, when we were in Claiborne, the work began. How do you shape a bunch of guys of divergent backgrounds into a cohesive fighting force? A training schedule was established and followed as closely as possible considering the conditions. If you recall, KP was one of the more onerous tasks. We started at 3 o'clock in the morning because we had wood-burning stoves, or I should say uh, fire-burning stoves. It was started with wood and finished off with coal. And that was the job for the KPs to get those fires started. And you had three stoves and a water heater that had to be kindled and lit, and the coal was added. And bins were refilled and the grease pits were cleaned and the pots were washed and the vegetables peeled and cleaned and the food served and the floors swept and mopped and tables were scrubbed. All of those tasks were completed about an hour after the last meal. <laughs> and due to an altercation, I'm sure it would shock you to be able to realize that I'd have an altercation, but uh, <laughs> due to the altercation, I uh, managed to get transferred to service battery out of E-Battery. A newly formed concept that was part of the triangular division concept. That is, when we were federalized, there was no service battery. There was a headquarters and service company, or a battery, and then it was split up to where the service battery was a separate uh, unit within the battalion. So that's how I got into the service battery. The service battery covered the, the handling of food, clothing, ammunition, tending, bedding, tools, and, and preservatives, oils, and lubricants. We were woefully under strength until we received our first draftees in late April. We were fortunate that our new men were from small towns and farms in Minnesota, the Dakotas, and Montana. Our training schedule needed severe adjustment. 
service battery worked continuously for 90 days. The whole camp was a sea of mud, and valuable time was needed for ditching and training and draining. Then hauling, hauling gravel and crushed seashells to cover the drained land. Boardwalks had to be built and installed in the battery street, leading to our pyramidal tent billets. All of this was in addition to KP, guard duty, latrine orderly, battalion runner, and the need to follow the training schedule, a portion of which was commander's time. It was spent giving information on current news and events because there was very few radios in the outfit and very little time for anyone to listen to. There were daily sessions of close order drill and the teaching of customs and courtesies of the service. All communication uh, classes covered both the use of radios and telephones, the E8 uh, telephone and the 536 radios. Physical training and cross country hiking to include field sanitation, daily inspections of living quarters, and a weekly inspection to include a full field layout of all the clothing and equipment. There was the necessity of learning the 11 orders of the guard. It was a weekly battalion sized parade and review with the full division artillery band providing the cadence and the music and the pageantry. By most civilian standards, this was a Herculean effort. But to our farm boy draftees, it was considered trivial duty. They were allowed to lay in bed until 0500. <laughs> the daily schedule ended with the retreat formation a little after 1700 hours. Their only distress was the knowledge that they were sorely needed at home. The, de the decision finally came to allow some respite in the daily grind, and we were trucked up to Shreveport. Each man had to show money necessary to cover a three-day pass that included hotel fare. Our first outing <coughs> camp had this expected effect. The majority of us got soused, became raucous and rowdy, got in fights, got laid, took our first prophylaxis, or prophylaxis as the case may be, and got as feculent and sick as possible. We were editorially invited to stay away. <laughs> our return to camp got us back on track trying to create a fighting force with drill and lots of memory work depending on individual assignments. From morning PT on to cannoneers, hop for the gun crews, to the proper radio terminology for the communication section, and the unending form, form numbers and manuals for clerks and supply people. To close all of this down, I'd like to point out some of the things we encountered. It was a rare Cajun farmhouse that didn't have a loaf of quartermaster bread as a doorstop because the quartermaster corps was trying to develop a, a bread <laughs> that had a hard enough crust to where it could be handled properly and still be palatable. They had a lot of miserable failures. And they were I well remember the snakes, the corals, the pygmy rattlers, the water moccasins, the scorpions and tarantulas were in abundance, and of course the chiggers, commonly called red bugs, <laughs> in most of Louisiana, there's an open range law, so fences were unnecessary, and there were quite a few scruffy looking cows and horses, and many razorback hogs that were wild. Lots of possums and armadillos, lots of swamps and bayous. And last but not least, the heavenly scent of the enormous magnolias that grow wild in the bayous. One other thing. If you recall, when we got into those mess halls, the cooks somehow were giving us saltpeter to reduce the libido. And I find that the saltpeter is actually beginning to take effect. This, uh, this is a picture that uh, Archie shared with us. I did my duty in Africa. <laughs> uh, by comparison, mine's going to be a very serious presentation. <laughs> I do want to start out by humming a little song mm. that uh, some of you in the audience will probably remember the tune to a 
a little ditty that we used to sing in the one, three, five. Good, like, <laughs> well, um, I was going to uh, sing the words to it, but Shrewsbury seemed to get by without censoring. They wanted to see mine in advance because he looks much more reserved than I do. And, uh, so they were sure that he wouldn't use any vulgarity. They censored mine and re edited it, and uh, only the words have been changed to protect the innocent. My apologies to the purists in the audience who will notice the difference. It went like this. Idy dighty, sakes all Friday. Who the heck are we? Rip ram, gal darn, we're the infantry. We're Colonel Nelson's troopers. We're riders of the night. We don't claim to be the nicest chaps. There's things we'd rather do than fight. <laughs> now, if, uh, if you think that song would have survived from November 11th, 1918 until 1941 when we went in the service with those words, you're full of it up to your ears. <laughs> so our next speaker, Jack Vesey, who I'm certainly proud to call an acquaintance and, a, and more so a friend, both of us joined the 34th Division in 1938. We didn't know each other at the time, but we were both approximately 15 years old. People have asked us, what did you do? Lie about your age? Absolutely not. We both exaggerated it a little bit. <laughs> Jack and I both joined as uh, privates, of course, and uh, I got out in 1945 as a PFC. Jack got out as a four-star general. I guess I don't have to tell you who had the answers to the test. <laughs> when we joined, it was less than 20 years after the November 11, 1918 armistice that we, yeah. most of us at our age in this group, uh, remember as the real Veterans Day, November 11th. Uh, in our organization, our regimental commander, Harold S. Nelson, our company commander, Hugh Soper, our mess sergeant, Max Montai, and our supply sergeant, Pepper Shabi, had all served in the Mexican border incident prior to World War I, chasing Pancho Villa. And uh, in fact, I came from a town where they pronounced it Villa for so long that I didn't know that it was the same guy. <laughs> Uh, it was some of these veterans from the American Expeditionary Forces of World War I that taught us some of the classic songs of the First World War. Not all those songs made it to Carnegie Hall, like this edited version of Mademoiselle from Armentiers. The first division went over the top, parlez-vous. The second division went over the top, parlez-vous. The third division stayed behind, now get this, to entertain the ladies while sipping wine. <laughs> that on you, Shrewsbury, how'd you get that stuff through that you were using? When I joined in 38, we were still wearing wrap leggings in the infantry, and uh, we were using the Springfield 03 rifle, and uh, the BAR was the big gun. We didn't even have mortars at that time. And uh, we got over a kind of jump over to uh, when we got down into Africa, our battalion commander, Jess Lee, was a former deputy sheriff, so he knew me, and you know, <laughs> deputy sheriffs had a tendency to know me at that time. <laughs> and he said, uh, Mac, I'd like to have you be my battalion scout. And I said, sure. I don't know what the hell I was thinking of. You know, I never read the 21-100 to find out what it said about what a scout did for a living. Oh, I remember that back home, they. You know, they tied knots and they uh, <laughs> started fires by rubbing sticks together. They helped little old ladies across the street and they slept in tents. Now, out of those four things, the only thing that I found out that a scout did, he slept in a tent. <laughs> but that was only the, only the first of many career mistakes I made both in and out of the Army. I marched in the Victory Parade in Tunis, which was pretty exciting. I suppose especially for those on the reviewing stand, which consisted of, I think, you know, I don't remember all of them, but I think they said Churchill and and uh, Eisenhower and Montgomery and de Gaulle and Sir Harold Alexander and I don't know who all, but it was an impressive array. As I walked by, I nodded at them just to show them that I did appreciate them being there. <laughs> when I got back to Iran, we were getting ready to go and land somewhere else. They didn't tell us where. And I was a PFC, so if they didn't tell me, I'm sure they didn't tell anybody else either. And uh, 
I knew it was time for a career change. So I went out and took the driver's training test. And it was, you know, kind of something different than being a battalion scout, which I found I didn't like at all. And, uh, but I had no idea. The uh, company commander asked me if I'd be his driver after I passed my exam, and I had no idea what a com uh, company commander's driver did for a living, so I said, sure. Well, uh, to make the, the long story short, when I was driving for him, he got the Distinguished Service Cross, and all I got was I got my good conduct ribbon back that they'd taken away from me back in Claymore. <laughs> in the course of the Italian campaign, uh, I got stabbed. Now, this was not by the enemy, although I certainly would call the guy a friend. <laughs> we were, uh, it was uh, Thanksgiving Day, and uh, so we were having a little card game, and there were two fellows right close to us, uh, one of whom uh, was embracing the other one's neck with his hands until he thought it was purple. And we kept saying, Gibson, knock it off, Gibson, knock it off. In the Army, in the infantry, you really didn't stop people from choking someone else. Uh, it was kind of metal, you considered it meddling, you know, that you kind of let them do their own thing. But pretty soon this fellow went limp, but he's purple, so I got up and cracked him one in the mouth. And with that, he pulled a knife and stabbed me in the knee, and I got infection, and I ended up in an exact hospital, and I had a cast, a leg long cast on. And of all times, I get there, and that morning, a guy came for my outfit. He knew I liked, uh, he knew I liked cognac. He knew I liked anything with alcohol. In the story, in fact. He came with a bottle of cognac, and I stuck it under my mattress there, and, and uh, he left. And I thought, well, I'll have some after a while. So. When he left, about five minutes later, I started having some. And uh, then Leo DeRocher came with some ball players, and you know it's pretty exciting. In, in our hometown, down in Owatonna, you were lucky to see the people from Faribault. <laughs> so here's Leo DeRocher and these ball players, and we're pretty excited. We're all, so by then I'm hitting a few more cognac, and Leo comes around. He shook my hand. Naturally, he'd want to see me. And, uh, we, we visited a little bit, and he said, are you coming over to the thing tonight? And I said, well, I can't. They had little catwalks about this wide, and the mud was about this deep right alongside of them, and I'm on crutches. You can't get crutches on a catwalk that wide, you know. So I kind of feeling sorry for myself. I had quite a bit of cognac. And in fact, the bottle started showing signs of being half empty rather than half full. And... Uh, about that time, I thought, you know, those crutches probably would work on that dog. Uh, uh, I tried it real hard and was careful. I went out and tried it, and it fell flat on my face in the mud. Fortunately, some guy came along because with a leg, uh, full leg cast, you can't really do much bouncing out of the mud, you know. And this guy came along, a big, hulking fellow, and he said, What's the matter, soldier? He said, Did you fall down? I said, No, damn it, I sleep here, fellow. <laughs> Well, he picked me up and, and he hauled me back into the tent. He asked me what tent I was in, and I, all I remember was it was, it was a canvas one. And <laughs> we went back in there and they started scrubbing me up, and the nurses coming in. They're getting me all cleaned up. With that, the guy took off his uh, raincoat. It turned out he was a major. And, uh, at the, <clears throat> I tried to apologize, and he said, No, it's really a kind of a stupid question to ask you. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was driving for this fellow that got the Distinguished Cross, Distinguished Service Cross, and he's a past president of the 34th Division Association, Al Lance from Savannah, Missouri. Some of you have heard of him, and uh, so he was he was a quite a famous company commander. When they'd get into a spot where they wanted to go on a fast overnight raid, and they were going to have an attack at two o'clock in the morning, four o'clock in the morning, they'd call Lance into division headquarters rather than get the briefing at regimental or battalion level. And so I'd drive him in there, and so it was not uncommon for me to see Charlie Ryder when he was uh, division commander. And I also, when my company commander was there, and we'd meet Ryder or any other senior officer, my company commander would salute, you know, in the jeep. And so when he wasn't there, I thought, well, somebody's got to do it. So I'm driving along. I see General Ryder. I salute. Ryder smiles at me, and he salutes back. And he smiles, and he's looking at his driver, and he's looking at me, and I thought, gee, what a nice guy. He not only salutes back, but he smiles at him. He's just a real decent guy. This happened on at least a dozen occasions until uh, one time I was talking to someone and, and I was telling him, what a nice guy he is. He salutes back. And he said, you dummy, the driver doesn't salute when the general does it. Well, anyhow, Charlie kept 
on every time I'd see him. One time I, my attention was diverted, and I'm driving along, and I look back, and here comes the general's car, and the general's saluting me before I even knew who it was. <laughs> I was driving in Oran after we were, we were uh, getting ready to go to Italy, and I was driving in Oran. A company commander said, get out and get some practice driving that Jeep. I don't want to be riding with an amateur. <laughs> and uh, so two fellows, tall, handsome, no insignia or anything, walking down the street. And I thought, well, they look like a couple of decent chaps. I stopped and said, you guys want to ride? And they looked at each other and they smiled. And they said, sure. So they hopped in the back of my Jeep, and I said, uh, what outfit? They said, we're Navy. I said, oh, where's your boat? And well, they don't call them boats, you know, but they smile and they said, get down on the pier. And I said, is that where you're going? Yes, it is, as a matter of fact. Well, I said, I'll give you a ride down there and show me how to get down there. So they pointed this way and that way. And we got down on the pier and we're driving down. We get down to their boat and all of a sudden, whistles are blowing and there's people standing and present arms and saluting and yelling out attention and everything. And I thought, God, I've never had this much attention in my life. For a little Jeep driver, I'm getting all this kind of attention. It was really impressive to me until I found out there was guys in the back end that were doing this. And they said, now, come on, we want you to come up uh, on the ship. And, and I said, no, I can't. My company commander said, do not leave your Jeep. You stick with it because they steal them around here. I said, don't worry about it. We'll put a couple of guards on duty, which they did. A couple of guys with rifles stood there ready to fight anybody that was going to try and steal their Jeep. And they got up on the boat. And they took me down a little corridor, and here was a fellow in the window, like a, like a bar, you know. And uh, these two chaps came up to him and said, now give this fellow all the candy and cigarettes that he can hold. And they said, thanks for the ride. I said, that's okay. And they walked on. And so they started giving me, like, cases and cases, uh, cartons and cartons of cigarettes. And what kind of candy bars do you like? Milky Way. Here's five cartons of Milky Way. I said, no, no. I said, a carton of candy and a couple of cartons of cigarettes, that's fine. He said, look, when the Admiral says, give him all he can hold. <laughs> that was you guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when, uh, when I got out of the Army, when I was about to get out of the Army, you know, the first sergeant came to me. Now, Jack was the first sergeant, but this is no reflection on him because at any rank, Jack was a gentleman, and I, I don't know, this first sergeant was that I'm talking about was not a gentleman. He was a horse's ass. You know? <laughs> so he came to me and he said, you know, it's part of my duty to ask you to re-enlist. He said, we're going to have an army of occupation over here, and we'd like to have you re-enlist. He said, uh, I know you don't like me, and he said, I expect that you'll turn me down, but he said, I, I have to do it. It's part of my job. And I said, Sergeant, I wouldn't stay in this man's army as long as you're a part of it. If you gave me a $10,000 bonus, I don't care what the rewards are. No, no, no. He said, that doesn't surprise me, McCready. He said, you and I have never gotten along. Never. And he said, in fact, I've always kind of thought that uh, we get out of this army, the war is over, we go home, you hear that I've died, you're going to find out where I'm buried, you're going to come and pee on my grave. <laughs> I said, no, you don't have to worry about that, Sergeant. A long time ago, I made up my mind, once I get out of this man's army, I'll never stand in line for anything. <laughs> Jesse, would you like to wind it up for us, sir? Bar <laughs> and Shrewsbury. I'm not sure, but what I ought to say, uh, the snow is snowing, it's time to fold it up and go home. <laughs> but I thought uh, that because I had uh, the same experiences as these people had, you don't want to hear another rehash of what happened to the 34th Division in World War II. And I thought I might end the evening by telling you a little bit about the perspective that uh, the experience of World War II had for me and brought to the subsequent 40-some uh, years of military service that I had and the opportunity to serve in, uh, in fairly senior positions as uh, either as Vice Chief of the Army or Chairman of the Joint Chiefs or Commander in Korea things of that nature. They, 
the uh, and it's time for the United States to look at its defenses uh, for the years ahead. Uh, Yogi Berra, one of the great contemporary American philosophers, said, when you come to a fork in the road, be sure you take it. <laughs> the, end of, the end of the Cold War, uh, with, the, with the outside world changing dramatically, with uh, us looking forward to a world which will contain, by the year 2035, twice as many people as it had when the Berlin Wall fell, uh, with us not quite knowing what the future holds, it's time for America to look again seriously at its defenses for the years ahead. And there are some lessons from this experience, it seems to me, that are worth, worth drawing. Uh, after listening to these guys here, except uh, these last two, I think uh, it might be well to, to listen to Jack Johnson again to understand what, in fact, the 34th Division accomplished. Jack raised the question, uh, was the Italian campaign worthwhile? Well, I think if one looks at the number of German divisions that were tied down and asked what would have happened at Normandy had those German divisions been available to oppose the landing in Normandy, I think you can come up with the, with the argument that yes, the Italian campaign was worthwhile. If one goes to Normandy and looks at the, at the cemeteries there and sees the price that we paid, which was really the price for being not ready for World War II during the 20s and the 30s. And if you can imagine what those cemeteries would look like had those top-notch German divisions that were in Italy but available to oppose the landing in Normandy, uh, I think you can understand that the campaign was well worthwhile and that the sacrifices were worthwhile. We talked a little bit, uh, we heard a little bit about the, the Battle of Casino, and Jack uh, uh, suggested that it was probably the defining battle for the 34th Division, and I would suggest that's probably correct. Many years later, when I was a student at the Command and General Staff College, my desk mate, my seat mate, was, a, was an Austrian officer whose last name happened to be Osterreicher, which means Austrian. Uh, but he was in the German Army in World War II, and he was in the 1st German Parachute Division, which were the defenders at Casino. And uh, he and most of the rest of the German Army believed that that was the best division German Army, so we know the sort of opposition that the 34th faced. As Jack pointed out, the division was a National Guard division, and it uh, had its roots in the great American militia tradition. Uh, Jack said that the division fought gallantly and was recognized as such, and that's true, but you can pick up history books. Uh, you pick up uh, even General Bradley's book, which talks about General Anderson, uh, the commander of the British First Army, asking that the 34th Division either be disbanded or pulled out of the line and go back for retraining. Because Anderson was, uh, uh, thought that the, the 34th Division's performance at Fond du Lac was uh, inadequate. That sort of <coughs> tag has crept into more history books than the history of what the 34th Division actually did. In fact, a few months ago, the history of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was being rewritten. My little part was sent to me uh, to review. And uh, what I, I will just tell you that I'll read a few lines from the, from the letter that I sent to the historian. Now, the first part concerning the division was, I said, another bit of great discomfort for me comes from the second paragraph in the words about the 34th Division. And I go on to say, I realize that General Bradley's book, among others, has the story about Anderson suggesting the withdrawal and retraining of the 34th. I said the story may well be correct. But like all the rest of the United States Army in North Africa, including the senior commanders, the 34th was not inhibited by lack of room for improvement. We didn't necessarily look particularly good 
but we certainly fought as well as any other division. And then I went on at some, some length about what the 34th Division had actually done. Uh, and in the end I said uh, that, uh, uh, and from all this, if you come to the conclusion that I don't want anything even faintly derogatory about the 34th in an article about me, you're absolutely correct. <laughs> and if the audience wants to read the blatherings of generals trying to shift blame for their own ineptness in Tunisia to the 34th, let them read a different book. <laughs> and I, I think that if one looks at what influence the 34th Division had on the Army uh, through the intervening years, one can understand the actual contribution of the 34th Division. You look at uh, the people that it produced in the regular army. We didn't have a lot of regular army officers uh, in World War II uh, with the division, but some grew out of the division into the regular army. Uh, you had General Balti, who was the second commander of the division during the war, who later was the vice chief of staff of the army, and probably one of the finest officers the army ever had. Uh, who could have worn combat patches from many different divisions. He always wore the 34th Division patch. Uh, Ken Burns, who commanded that battalion of the 135th that got up around the top of Casino there, later uh, a Lieutenant General, a Corps Commander in, in Europe, senior officer on the Army staff, always wore the 34th Division patch. Uh, and the same was true with many others, including me. I, I served in combat with, uh, with other regular army divisions and commanded an outfit that uh, got the presidential unit citation, uh, but I always wore uh, the 34th Division patch with great, great pride. That came because of certain, a certain uniqueness that, uh, that the National Guard Division uh, brought to the Army. Uh, general Anderson, the British general who suggested that the 34th ought to be retrained, said it was undisciplined. Uh, what I would say to you is that it may have been undisciplined in the sense that uh, Anderson looked at his own British troops and in the sense that he might have gotten from listening to uh, the Norm <laughs> talk about the division. But the thing that the 34th Division had that uh, was particularly rich, it had no indiscipline. No indiscipline. Uh, when one looks at indiscipline, I mean soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who do the wrong thing who get in trouble for, uh, and get court-martialed for going absent without leave or whatever it is. Uh, I don't remember a court-martial of a National Guard soldier that came from the Midwest who went into the 34th Division. There certainly were some, probably, but I know of none. It was a tremendous source of strength that uh, the division brought to the Army. People-wise, we had uh, uh, people like Norman Hendrickson, Fritz Peterson, uh, Don Grant, who were uh, Gene Sertig, who were stalwarts, and many, many others uh, uh, that uh, many of you could mention, uh, who taught uh, people who served later on how to be real leaders, how to be human and be leaders. My own personal experience and the experiences that we had, which were cited here, particularly by, uh, by Jack, but also by the others, uh, led me to understand, as I told the, the historian here, I said that uh, the, uh, I said for the next 42 years, those who served with me suffered from my eccentricities about realistic combat training, about protecting soldiers, about modern equipment, about physical fitness and air ground coordination. Those things led to uh, 
events that took place in the army that uh, that you saw on the battlefield at, uh, in Desert Storm. Uh, one of the one of the things that I left Italy and North Africa with was the determination that we would find ways to train the army of the future, and take all the bang bang you're dead out of military training and make it as realistically uh, close to battle as we possibly could. And from that grew such things as the National Training Center, which is uh, completely instrumented uh, with the lasers that, uh, that uh, uh, simulate each of the weapons on the battlefield so that when the soldiers go and fight on that battlefield at the National Training Center, as the guardsmen here will tell you, uh, everything that's happened is instrumental. You can't say, I, I, I did it right, but it didn't turn out right, because whatever you said has been recorded, uh, every shot you took was instrumented, whether you hit or missed is instrumented, uh, so that the soldier is trained to understand what happens on the battlefield. And certainly not everything goes right on the battlefield. But as the soldiers in Desert Storm would say afterward, it was almost as hard as the National Training Center. <laughs> uh, and that's what grew out of the experience of the 34th Division in North Africa in World War II, as well as the determination to provide our soldiers with, uh, with equipment that worked and that gave them a technological edge on the battlefield. Uh, in North Africa, as was mentioned, we didn't have a weapon that would uh, penetrate the front places with a turret of a German tank. If you wanted to make a hole in it, you had to get behind it. Uh, if we heard airplanes, we didn't look up because we knew they belonged to the Germans and not, uh, not to us. So those experiences permitted the rest of the army that came on later in the war to be better trained. But more importantly, it committed, permitted the Army and the Navy and the Air Force and the Marine Corps that followed during the 50 years of the Cold War to be immensely better trained than we ever were. Now the question is, what will we do in the future? Our defense budgets are now down to about the percentage of the gross domestic product that they were in 1939. Uh, the, armories of, of, of towns that had National Guard troops for uh, 75 years have been closed. Uh, and the question is, how will we in America ensure that the armed forces of the United States are tied to the people of the United States? And how will we ensure that we have enough of a force that is well trained enough to, to meet whatever tomorrow comes over the horizon? We don't know what it will be. Uh, many politicians will say, well, there aren't any enemies out there today. Uh, no, perhaps there aren't. There aren't any identifiable ones. But uh, surely uh, coalitions of nations, uh, mistakes by politicians, create the opportunities for enemies to arise. And we'll, they're far less likely to arise if we for it. So I think it's uh, important that we here uh, thank the, uh, the uh, World War II seminar for recording this particular uh, history. Uh, I'd like to pay tribute to my old friend Dr. Harold Deutsch for whom this seminar is named. And, uh, Elizabeth, his widow, is here in the, in the hall with us tonight. And Don Patton for assembling this group and uh, say thanks to my old comrades here for uh, providing us with not only history but uh, a little entertainment. <laughs> uh, and thank you for coming. I know it's getting late. Uh, are there any real quick questions? Just take a couple and then we'll uh, just kind of break up here. Yes? How did uh, Minnesota lose the 34th Division 
and end up with a 47 instead, since it's a considerable part of the 34. I, I'd be interested in having the group respond to that. Yeah. The 34th Division was headquartered in Iowa before World War II. And uh, the, we had to create a division to give us one. So the 47th Division became the Minnesota Division. The 34th Division is back, but I, I think it's going to have some expenses with it. The, uh, Eventually, Iowa is going to want the headquarters back, and uh, I think they <clears throat> they're going to work at it. I hope we, we don't. They don't get it back, but uh, if they do, we won't have a headquarters. We won't have a division. That's my, that's my concern. My, uh, my concern is will we have any? Yeah. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Yes, sir. In the back. I've got a question I have, and I don't remember where I got it. A partial history, and it was an official one from Allied or something or other. But it ended up on the 29th of September, 1944. Does anybody have any idea whether they ever? finish that up, other than the very condensed version that I got from somewhere else. Or would that, anybody have any idea of where I might get yeah, it? Yeah, Jack can answer the question. I'm not sure which one that you're referring to. Uh, there was a there was a, a partial one that I saw, uh, which ultimately was, was filled out to the end, but I would point out We've got a book for sale here tonight on the history of the 135th. Uh, I think it's about 15 or 16 dollars called To the Last Man. And that certainly takes it from the Civil War right up through into the 1970s. Support for this program provided by viewers like you. Thank you. Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org Production services provided by Barrows Productions.